Hello everybody, my name is Martin Kleppmann and I'd today like to talk about formal verification of programs with Isabel. So the problem here that we're really trying to attack is if you've written a program, how do you know that it does what you want it to do? How do you know that the program is correct? And of course for most of us writing programs the answer is we write tests. So with unit tests what you do is you think of some inputs to your program, you run them through your program, you check the outputs, and you check whether the outputs are what you were expecting for the given inputs. And this works, and of course we use testing a lot, but it is limited because testing can only cover the examples that you thought about. So when you were thinking of the example inputs to provide to your program, only those will be tested, and if there are any bugs in your program that are not triggered by those particular inputs, then the tests won't find them. So people have generalized this idea and moved, for example, introduced this idea of property-based testing. So with property-based testing, the idea is there's a random test generator that produces lots and lots of random inputs, and it tries to find some uh, input that will make your program fail. So you would write uh, some condition on the output that you expect to always be true, and the, pro the test generator will try to find some input for which the properties don't hold. And this is good because it generalizes the tests, uh, the tests that are run beyond just the inputs that you thought about, but to a broader set. But it's still limited to fairly small examples. Now, taking this idea even further, with model checking, we try to systematically enumerate all the possible inputs that could happen. And so, this is a more formal uh, technique for verification, and it's used, for example, with tools like TLA+. But with uh, model checking, what happens is there is an exponential explosion in the state space to be tested. So if you imagine you want to model check some kind of distributed program, and in a distributed system you might send messages over the network, and those messages might be delivered out of order. And so the more, if you send just one more message, then the number of possible orderings of those messages, or indeed which messages are delivered and which are not, grows extremely quickly. And so with model checking, if you are trying to enumerate all of the possible orders in which, in which messages could be delivered, well, you have to limit it to some number of maximum messages. And that number of maximum messages will have to be fairly small. It might be like four or five messages. Um, because otherwise, it would simply take far too long to actually go through all of the possible combinations. And so while, this is help while model checking is helpful, because of this bound that you have to place on the size of the model, it means that if there is a bug that is only triggered in executions with six messages, say, and your bound on the model was a maximum of five messages, well, then again, model checking won't find the bug. So what we want to talk about today is formal proof. And the really interesting thing about formal proof is that we can reason about potentially infinite state spaces. So that is, in a distributed algorithm, if, mul if multiple messages are sent with a proof, we can reason about uh, executions with any number of messages without having to put any upper bound on the number of messages that are sent. So these executions can be arbitrarily long, and because of that, there's an infinite number of possible states that the system could be in. And with proof, we can actually show that in all of those infinite possible combinations, uh, always the right thing will happen. And so this is what makes proof very powerful, but it also means that proof is quite a bit of work. You will probably be familiar with pen and paper proofs. This is something that mathematicians have been using for hundreds of years. And in a pen and paper proof, you use natural language, you use English, for example, to make your argument step by step. And so you might also use some mathematical notation, but in general, the pen and paper proof is consumed by another human. So another person is going to read through the proof and check each step of the proof and see whether they think the argument is convincing. And if so, then we believe that the statement you are trying to prove is true. Now, computer scientists have been looking at the problem of proof for quite a while as well. And so they have developed techniques for fully automated proof. So for example, Z3 is what is called an SMT solver. This is a tool which can prove statements automatically. And what you do is you write your statement that you want to prove in a formal language, and Z3 or these other tools will try to fully automatically find uh, some proof that demonstrates that this statement is true. 
Now, this is very powerful when it works, but it does have limitations, unfortunately, because in general, uh, finding a proof for a given statement is undecidable, just like the halting problem. It is a problem that, in general, it is impossible to write a computer program that will, in all cases, be able to find a proof for a given statement, even if that statement is true. And another problem is that the bigger the, and more complicated the proof gets, the harder it becomes for an automated proof tool to find that proof. And so, while it works well for simple examples, it does also run into limitations that eventually some problems are simply too hard to be proved in a fully automatic way. And this is where proof assistants come in. So proof assistants are somewhere half between, halfway between pen and paper proofs and fully automated proofs. So with a proof assistant like Isabel, what we will do is we as humans will write the main steps of the proof by hand, um, but we use that using a proof language, a special language that the computer can understand. It's a bit like a programming language, but for proofs. And also the computer is going to help us. So the, the computer can tell us at each stage uh, what, the, what the assumptions are, what the facts are that we can use in order to prove the next step of the argument, and it will help us keep track of the steps of reasoning. So it's very useful for big and complicated proofs because the computer can help us. Moreover, the computer will also check that our argument is actually correct. And the computer will only allow the proof to finish if we have demonstrated for every single step that that step is really true. And if the computer has actually been able to check formally that each of those steps is true. So proof assistants are very interesting because they bring together the human and the computational methods for proof. Um, and they do check the proof automatically so we can make sure that we haven't made any errors in our reasoning. Now, all of these proof techniques are still, unfortunately, quite a lot of work to do. And you might wonder whether it is at all worth the bother, because if it's a lot of work to do these proofs, then, you know, do we gain enough for it to be worth the investment? And so I would say for some very standard code that is easy to understand and not very problematic, I would say probably it's not worth doing any proofs, um, because in this case, it's simply not worth the effort. But proofs are extremely useful with algorithms that are very subtle or have a very large number of combinations of the way things could happen. This is often the case in distributed systems where message might be delivered in any arbitrary order, messages might be delivered never at all or might be delivered multiple times. And so we've got a lot of things going on concurrently and we've got a lot of failure modes in which the system could potentially fail. And we have to somehow reason about all of these. And this is quite difficult to do informally uh, because our brains are simply not very well wired to reason about very highly concurrent systems uh, because they have a very complicated state space, very complicated combinations of things that could happen at different points in time. And for these types of algorithms, formal proof is very useful because it helps us ensure that even these very subtle algorithms are correct under all circumstances. And they also help us as humans. So as we write a proof, it actually ensures that we understand exactly why the algorithm works. Uh, and we have to understand that very well in order to do the proof. And so the proof is actually useful, not just to demonstrate that the algorithm is correct, but actually for us ourselves as designers of the algorithm to really understand the domain better. But there's one more reason why I think proof is a very cool thing to look at. And this is illustrated by this wonderful quote by my collaborator, Dominic. So Dominic told me at some point a few years ago, Isabel is the world's most complicated video game. And there's something true about this because there's something really fun and really uh, almost addictive about writing these proofs in Isabel because it's a bit like a puzzle game where you know, you have these facts and this other fact and this lemma, and so maybe using this proof rule, you might be able to combine them to get to this step of the argument and then use that in order to combine with this other assumption over here to get to the next step and so on. And so it's, it's actually remarkably good fun. And part of what I want to do in this video is to demonstrate a bit of the way in which this is actually fun. Of course, it is still difficult and complicated, um, but this, and this way of interacting with a computer in order to prove the, uh, make some proofs uh, is actually remarkably good fun. So I hope I will be able to bring that across. So what we're going to talk about is 
formal verification of distributed systems. Of course, there are many different types of programs you could formally verify, but I will just focus on distributed systems for now. Now, it turns out that Isabel actually doesn't have built-in support for distributed systems, but that's okay, because Isabel has some general purpose data structures like lists and sets, and we can just use those data structures in order to model our distributed system in just a few lines of code. And so uh, we can just use the, the standard data structures provided by Isabel in its standard library. And the particular algorithm that I want to formalize today is a consensus algorithm. So you might have come across consensus before. It's a very core problem in distributed systems where you want to get several processes to agree on some value. And there are several famous algorithms for consensus, so Paxos, for example, or Raft. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time in this particular video to talk through Paxos or Raft since they are fairly big, fairly complicated algorithms. So I'm going to use a simpler consensus algorithm uh, as a demonstration in this talk. Now, this uh, particular consensus algorithm is not very fault tolerant, but it is a consensus algorithm. It does achieve the agreement property, and that is what uh, the main property that needs to be true in a consensus algorithm. So if you think about any algorithm, if you want to prove it correct, you need to define what correct means. And in the cons case of consensus, one of the main properties we care about is agreement. And so we can define agreement like this. If any two processes learn a value that has been decided, or if they decide a value, then those values that have been decided must be the same. So this is uh, an example of how we might use consensus. Uh, the example is we have several people who want to decide where to go to lunch and everybody has to go to the same place for lunch. This is our requirement. So we have different people here. For example, we have proposer one at the top in red, proposer two in blue, and they are both proposing places to go for lunch. So one wants to go and eat tacos, proposer two wants to go and eat falafel. And so what we need to ensure is that uh, all these people who want to agree on the place to go for lunch will eventually agree on the same place. And the algorithm we're going to use in this talk, the consensus algorithm, works like this. So we're going to define one of the processes, one of the nodes in the system, as what is called the acceptor. And so you can think of this as like a master or a leader database. And any other process in the system that wants to propose a value has to send their proposal to the acceptor as a message over the network. And so the acceptor just sits there waiting for proposals and then at some point a proposal will come in and the way the acceptor is going to make a decision is it simply chooses the first value that it sees in a proposal message. And so in this case here the proposal from proposer 2, which is the value falafel, arrives at the acceptor first. And so what the acceptor is going to do is it's going to update its local state to say, I have decided the value falafel, and it's going to reply back to proposer two saying, fine, I have accepted your value falafel. Falafel is where you're going to go for lunch. And the proposer one's request, well, that arrives second at the acceptor. And so when the proposal for tacos arrives at the acceptor, the acceptor says, well, sorry, I've already made a decision. I have already decided the value falafel. And so it will reply back to proposer one saying, no, I have already accepted the value falafel. So this is the value that everyone must go with. And you can see then the end result is that both proposer one and proposer two see the same decided value, which is falafel. And so everyone is consistent, which is exactly what we required of consensus. So let's look at this data flow here a bit more abstractly and think about how we could model this formally. And just removing the labels for a moment, what I'm going to do now is to break the time of the execution here into discrete time steps. And so here we have time flowing from left to right. And I can say, for example, that the proposal by proposal proposer one happens in time step one. So it's a request from user one in time step one. In time step two, we have a request at proposer two. At time step three, the proposal from proposer two is received by the acceptor, while at time step four, the proposal from proposer one is received by the acceptor. And then at time step five and six, the two responses from the acceptor are received at the two proposers, respectively. And so here we can model this by each, uh, in each time step, an event happens, and that event happens at one of the processes in the system. 
And the event could be, for example, a user request, or it could be a message being received over the network. And so as the side effect of the processing any event, we might update some state and we might send messages over the network. So this is how we can model this distributed algorithm in Isabel. We can break the execution into some linear sequence of time steps. And this is very similar to what other tools like TLA plus do. And then at each time step, one of the processes is going to handle an event. And in our example that we will use, I've defined three types of event. So there's a user request, that is um, a user wants to request a certain value. There is a message received from the network and there's a timeout. And so we're going to say that each process in the system, it doesn't just do something out of its own accord, each process uh, performs some computation only in response to one of these three events being received. So the event is the trigger for any of the processes to do whatever it needs to do. And so now we can define what each process does using a step function. So the step function is going to be some function that determines what happens, what is the logic that is executed at one of the processes when one of these events occurs. And so we can model this step function as a function that takes three arguments. So the first argument is going to be the process ID, that is, which process is executing right now. The second argument is going to be the current local state of that process. So we're going to say that each process can have some local state and each process can read and write its own local state, but you can't have one process reading and writing the state of another process. That doesn't work. The only way that processes communicate is by sending messages over the network. They can't see each other's state directly. And this is a good model for what distributed systems are actually like in practice. So our second argument to the step function is going to be the current local state of that particular process that is executing. And the third argument is going to be the event. So what is it that happened, which might be a user request, a message received, or a timeout. And this step function is now going to return two things. Firstly, it's going to return an updated local state for this particular process. And secondly, it's going to return a set of messages that are sent as part of the execution of this particular step. And that is actually enough to model our distributed algorithm. So I'm going to show you what this will look like in Isabel syntax, and then we can actually dive in and write down our little consensus algorithm in Isabel. So I'm just going to compare the syntax to Python because probably most people will have seen Python. And so in Isabel, there are several ways how you could define a function. So there's the fun keyword or the definition keyword. There are subtle differences between the, them, but for our purposes today, you can just treat them as more or less equivalent. And so you could write the identity function like this. So the identity function that just takes some argument x and returns that same argument. You can also have anonymous functions. So in Python, you would write out the, lam the word lambda x colon x. Uh, in Isabel, you would just write the Greek letter lambda. And finally, if you want to call a function or apply some arguments to a function, then uh, in most programming lang languages, you would put parentheses around the arguments. In Isabel, it uses the same kind of syntax as in ML or OCaml, which is that it uses the function name space argument. And so the arguments are just then uh, separated by spaces. Okay, so that's enough Isabel syntax. Let's see how we might formalize this consensus algorithm. So in this consensus algorithm here, what we need to do is write down the logic that is executed at each of the processes. And so firstly, we have to think about the proposer and the acceptor separately. So an acceptor will wait for messages, uh, proposal messages, and send out accept messages, whereas a proposer will wait for user requests send the proposal message to the acceptor and then receive the accept message back from the acceptor. And so we could write this in pseudocode like this. So we're going to write a step function for the proposer and a separate step function for the acceptor. And the proposer, uh, first of all, waits for events. So the first event that it waits for is a user request. And when it receives a user request, it will take the value in that user request and send it to the acceptor as a propose message. And then, Finally, when the uh, proposer gets back the response message from the acceptor, then the proposer can update its own local state saying we have now learned the decided value. On the acceptor side, 
what the acceptor does is it only waits for messages to be received from the network, and so in particular it waits for proposal messages from proposers. And when a proposal message is received, the acceptor will look at its own local state. And if it has already seen a value, uh, if it has already decided a value previously, then it will just send that previously decided value back to the proposer. Otherwise, if it has not previously decided a value, it will now decide the value from the proposer and then respond with that same value. So let's see how we can actually write this in Isabel. This is Isabel. So it's a kind of IDE. You can see the first thing we do is to import a library called network. This library is something that I defined to a model a distributed system, and I will show you later what that looks like. And then the first thing we do here inside the main file is uh, we define the type of messages that can be sent over the network. So here, this is saying the message can be one of two types. It can be either a propose message or an accept message. And each of these messages carries an argument of type val. So this tick val here is a type variable, which is unconstrained. So this is saying a propose message can contain a value of any type. And likewise, an accept message can contain a value of any type. And we don't need to define further what that data type is. Now, the proposer and acceptor step functions match quite closely the pseudocode that we just saw. So for the proposer, first of all, the first thing we are going to do is handle a user request. So here the step function is going to take two arguments. The first argument is going to be the local state of that particular process at the time when the event occurred. And then secondly, the actual event that occurred. And so here we're saying that the local state is an option type. And so an option type can have either a value of none, which is like a null essentially, or it can have a value of some x. So here this is the, or some val uh, for wrapping up some, the value that is present, uh, or none when the value is absent. And so here, what we are saying is the local state uh, can be none, which means it is undecided. We don't yet know what the decided value is, or the local state could be a decided value. And uh, for the uh, events that can occur, here we have a request. In fact, this is, we can see what the definition of the event type looks like. We have here, as I said earlier, three types of event, either receiving a message from a particular sender, uh, and this is the actual message received, or we can have a request from a user, which can contain any value, val, or the event that occurred could be a timeout. And so here in the step function now, we're going to handle uh, these events that can occur. And in the first line, we are handling a user request. So when a user request appears at a proposer, well, our local state before is none, our local state afterwards is still none, so we're not changing our local state, but we are sending a message over the network. So here these curly braces is to indicate a set because we might send multiple messages, but in this case, we're only sending a single message and we're sending it to process zero. So I'm going to define here as a convention that the process with ID zero is the acceptor and the processes with ID one, two, three, et cetera, are the proposers. And so this is just a convenient way for identifying which process is which. And I'm going to say here, the recipient of this message is the uh, acceptor, that is, um, that is process number zero. And the message we're sending is this proposed message containing the value that was requested by the user. So that is the first step of the step function. And uh, we, uh, match, we use pattern matching here to figure out how to handle the different types of events. So the next event that a proposer might handle is receiving an accept message over the network. So here we're saying that when the proposer receives this message here uh, from a particular sender. The sender we're just leaving here is underscore, which means we don't care who the sender of this accept message is. Uh, when we receive this accept message, now we update our local state. So previously, the local state was none, and now we're updating this local state to some val, where val is the value that appeared in the accept message. And we're not sending any more messages. So here, that is why at the end, we have the curly braces empty set. So at the point when we receive the accept message from the acceptor, 
then we update the local state, but we don't send any more messages. And finally, the third line here is the catch all. So this is matching any pattern that is not one of the two lines above. And here we're saying that a proposer receives any event underscore here, any other event that is not request from a user or receiving an accept message. The current state is state, so we're going to remain in the same state state, and we're not going to send any messages. And so this is just a no op. Uh, it does nothing. It leaves the process in the same state and it doesn't uh, send any messages. Next, we have the code for the acceptor here. And so the acceptor, the main thing it has to do is handle the receipt of a proposal message. And that's what we have here. So we're pattern matching here on the message receive event. And here, when we receive a message propose val from some sender, and we are in the local state state, then, well, what we do depends on what our current local state is. So if we have previously already decided a value, that is our local state is some v, then our local state is going to remain some v. So we're not going to change our local state and we are going to reply back to the sender with an accept message containing that value v, so containing the previously decided value. On the other hand, if the state at the time that the proposed message is received, if that state is none, so it is not yet decided any value, now we update the local state to be some val, where val is the value in the proposed message, and we send a message back to the sender, an accept message containing that same value val. And so this does all of the logic that the acceptor needs to do in order to decide a value. So the last line is again just the catch all uh, where we say wildcard matching on any type of event, we remain in the same state and we do not send any messages. So it's a no op just as before. And finally, now we can put these two functions together into a single function. Our step function here is going to take as first argument the process, the ID of the process that is executing. And I said earlier, process zero, we are defining to be the acceptor. So if the process equals zero, we're going to delegate to the acceptor step function. Otherwise, uh, if the process is one or greater, then we're going to call the proposer step function. And this means we can have any number of proposers, but exactly one acceptor, which is what we require for the algorithm. Now, next, before we can actually go into the details of proving the agreement property, I need to introduce just a little bit more uh, mathematical notation. So first of all, logical implication. You might have seen this before if you have uh, previously done some mathematics. Also, I can write uh, some number of statements p1 to pn imply some statement q. And what this means is that if all of these statements p1 to pn are true, then we can conclude that the statement q must also be true. And so this right-hand arrow here, pointing from left to right, is the implication that means if the left-hand side, then the right-hand side. And these uh, little hat operators here are the and, so the logical conjunction. Sometimes this is also written as repeated arrows. Uh, so p1 implies p2 and so on, uh, up to q. And this means exactly the same thing. So it's just a different way of writing the same thing. So given this little bit of notation, we can now formalize the agreement property. So we had this, had it like this as an English sentence. We said that if any two processes learn decided values, then the values that they have learned must be the same. And so let's write this out a little bit more formally. So we can think about it like this. Say we have some variable states that represents the state of all of the processes after having executed any number of steps of our consensus algorithm. So this might be maybe the initial state if it's executed no steps, or it might be 100 million uh, states later, 100 million steps later that we have reached some kind of uh, states of all of the processes. So assuming this variable states, we can now say that the state of process one equals some value one, and the state of process two equals some value two for any arbitrary two processes, proc one and proc two. And so under these assumptions, we want to prove that value one must equal to value two. That is our agreement property. And we can 
write the same thing in Isabel and it will look something like this. So we can say we want to write the theorem on agreement and I need to first of all encode the assumption that we have a valid execution. And I will write it like this. So execute is a predicate that I've defined previously. I will show you later what that looks like. And it takes six arguments. The first argument that it takes is the name of the step function that we're going to execute. So because we have to, uh, we have to say exactly which algorithm we're executing. And we're saying we're, algorithm we are executing the algorithm whose step function is this consensus step. The second argument I need to give is the initial state of each of the processes. And I'm going to give this as an anonymous function that takes as argument the process ID P and it returns the initial state of process P. I'm going to say the initial state for all of the processes is just none. So remember the local state is an option type and so I can just say there's a fixed value none that is the initial state for all of the processes. Now the third argument is the set of processes that exist in the system. And so for some algorithms this is very important. So for some algorithms that use majority voting, for example, they need to know what the processes are in order to be able to know when they have a majority of votes. But for our algorithm actually it doesn't matter. We don't have to specify what the processes are exactly. So I'm just going to say univ, which is the universal set. And it's simply a set that contains anything and we don't care particularly what is inside it. It can even be an infinite set of processes and this algorithm will still work. So those were the first three arguments. The next three are called events, messages, and states. And so these three are variables that we are introducing here. And these variables uh, will define the execution that happened. And so we're saying here that events is the list of events that occurred in the process of uh, some valid execution of this consensus algorithm. Messages is the set of all messages that were ever sent at any point in this execution. And states represents the final state of all of the processes after having executed this sequence of events. And so this is now saying here that, uh, that here this uh, states is the final state after having executed any number of steps of this consensus algorithm. So with that done, we can now uh, specify that we want the final state of any two processes to have some value. So let's say we assume that the states of state of process one is some value one. And likewise, the state of process two is some value two. So those are our three assumptions. And under those assumptions, we want to show that value one equals value two. Okay, I hope this makes sense. This is our formal statement of the agreement property. Um, so we've just taken our previous verbal description of this property and restated it in this slightly more formal language. And what I'm going to do now here is just to type sorry at the end. So sorry is Isabel's keyword, which just says, simply believe me. I'm not going to prove this right now. I'm just going to assert that this uh, statement here, that this theorem is true. Uh, and well, uh, I'm not going to actually go through the effort of proving it. So as you can imagine, a, uh, once we have finished the proof, we would not want any sorry to remain in the file because sorry is our cop out. But it's an extremely useful cop-out while we're in the process of writing the proof because we will have to make some choices of what things to prove first and what things to prove later. So, think, so, th so some things while we're writing the proof we will just have to take as given for now and then at some later point we can come back and actually fill in the proof for all of those. So sorry allows us to write the proof incrementally bit by bit uh, which is extremely useful. Uh, one final thing to point out here now is that at the bottom Isabel is giving me uh, a statement of this theorem and so it's saying that we have proved, well we haven't actually proved but it, we are asserting this theorem here um, that under the assumption that we have a valid execution um, that the two values are the same. The question is now how do we actually prove this agreement property? It seems kind of obvious if you just look at the algorithm, the way we've constructed it. Well, the only way that 
two processes can reach a decision is by them going through the acceptor and thus we have only a single one possible decision so everyone must decide the same well but unfortunately it just seems obvious it's not quite good enough for Isabel so if we want to prove it formally we have to approach this step by step and the way we can approach this kind of proof step by step is a technique called a proof by invariance so an invariant is some kind of property that is true at every step of the execution. And so we start off in some initial state where this property is true. And then whenever we perform one step of execution, we prove that that property remains true. And using those properties, we can then make statements about what the execution as a whole will do. And so it turns out that in order to prove this agreement property, we need two invariants. And I'm going to introduce them one by one. So the first invariant is this. Given any proposer p, we're going to say if p state is some value, that is p has decided a value and that decided value is val, then there must exist some process a that has sent a message except val to p. So what do we think? So let's have a look actually at what the code for a proposer looks like. So as a proposer here, we're saying if the state is some val, well, the only way how the state of a proposer can become some val is this line here. So the only way how we can end up in the state some val is by having received an accept message with that same val. And the only way we could receive an accept message is if somebody actually sends that accept message. So this means invariant one looks plausible. Okay, I think we can probably convince ourselves that it's true. What about invariant two? So invariant two is this. If a message accept val has been sent, then the acceptor must be in the state some val. Okay, so if this message has been sent, who sends a message? Well, here a proposed message is getting sent, but we're interested in accept messages. So here an accept message gets sent, and here another accept message gets sent. These are the only two lines on which accept messages get sent. And our invariant is if message accept val has been sent, then the acceptor is in the state some val for the same val. So here we say if accept val has been sent, then we are in state some val. If accept v has been sent, then we are in state some v. So, okay, this invariant also looks plausible. The question now, is this actually enough to prove the property that we want? In order to write down these invariants more formally in Isabel, we need, again, just a little bit more mathematical notation. So the upside down letter A here means for all. And so this say, is saying that for all possible values of the variable x, the statement P of x must be true. And we have a similar construction, which is the uh, mirrored E letter, which means there exists. So there exists x such that P of x is true. This means that we can find at least one value, maybe more than one value, but at the very minimum one value x for which the statement p of x becomes true. Okay, so given those definitions, we can now take these invariants uh, and write them out more formally in Isabel. So I am going to copy these from a different file to save a little bit of time. And here we have the two invariants. So let's look at them, make sure we understand what's going on here. So first of all, I put here in a comment the English verbal description of the invariant. So for invariant one is for any proposer P. So what is a proposer? We said the acceptor is process number zero. So a proposer must be any process uh, whose ID is not equal to zero. So this is here saying proc is a proposer, its ID is not equal to zero. If the state of P is some val, okay, that is what we have here, the state, the state uh, of process proc equals some val. If those things are true, then, so the then is represented by this arrow here. So this is again an implication arrow. If the things on the left-hand side of the arrow are true, then the thing on the right-hand side of the arrow must also be true. So on the right-hand side is 
there exists a process that has sent a message except val to p. There exists a process which is here called sender such that this accept message here was sent. The recipient of the message is proc, in this case p, and the sender is here, this sender process. And we are saying that this pair here exists in the set of messages. So this set of messages here contains pairs where the first element of each pair is the sender of that message and the second one is this send constructor here which just packages up the recipient of a message and the actual content of the message. So this is invariant one. Invariant two says that if a message except val has been sent, so if this message has been sent, this is very similar to what we had previously, so if there, if there is some sender and recipient and val such that this pair here exists in the set of messages. Then, again we have the implication if then, then the acceptor is in the state some val. Remember the acceptor is state number zero, so we're saying here the state of process number zero equals some val. Okay, so now we have translated the English descriptions of the two invariants into Isabel. Now we can actually see if we can use those. So what we want to see is, are those two invariants sufficient in order to prove this agreement property? I'm going to say it is, but let's actually try and prove it. So in order to prove that, I'm first going to put in the assumption that the invariants are true. And I'm going to do this by introducing this additional lemma here. And I'm going to say, we make the same assumptions here about uh, events, messages, and states being some valid execution. And then under that assumption, we're going to assume that invariant holds for messages and states, and invariant two also holds for messages and states in that execution. And again, I'm going to say sorry here which is just going to mean that um, assume for now that these invariants are indeed true under these assumptions. And let's see if we can prove the agreement theorem under that assumption. So I'm going to get rid of this sorry here and go into proof mode. So let's think a little bit about how this proof actually should work. So what we have is here this assumption that the state of process one is some value one. So we have that assumption. And here, note that on the left-hand side of the implication in invariant one, we have here the state of P is some val. So we should be able to use invariant one to deduce that some this accept val message has been sent. So if P state is some val, if we assume invariant one is true, then this accept val must have been sent. And then also we now have invariant two, which says if this accept val has been sent, then the acceptor must be in the state some val. So if we combine both of these, we should be able to deduce actually from this here, because p state is some val, then the acceptor state must also be some val. So let's say that we think that the state of the acceptor should be some value one. So this is using this assumption here and using the two invariants. So I'm now going to try to prove this statement and I'm going to use a Isabel feature which is very useful. It's called Sledgehammer. So Sledgehammer is going to try to automatically search for a proof of this statement that I have made. And if it has been successful, then it will say down here at the bottom that a proof has been found and it has given me this very strange looking line here, which I can just click and it will put it in the file for me. And so what this here means is, Isabel has been able to prove this statement here based on various facts. And so the facts that we have are assumptions one and two, that is these two assumptions from the definition of the theorem. Furthermore, we're using the definitions of the two invariants, invariant one and invariant two, and we're using this invariance lemma that we had, that we just defined, that we gave, uh, that we just assumed to be true by saying sorry. 
And so Isabel has used those facts and it's used Metis, which is one of several built-in proof methods in Isabel. So Metis is one of several algorithms that given a bunch of facts, searches for a proof and tries to make this statement true. And if successful, that means that uh, Isabel has really been able to prove that this statement is indeed true. And so this is very good progress uh, because it means that we now can be sure of this statement and we can continue working forwards from this. So this is very encouraging. We've been able to use the two invariants. Secondly, now we should be able to make a very similar argument using this other assumption. So remember, what we were saying is that using the assumption that process one is, has value one, we were able to deduce that the acceptor is in state value one. Well, we should be able to make a very similar argument saying, assuming that process two is in state some value two, then the acceptor must also be in state value two. So let's encode that here. So moreover, we have that the state of the acceptor is some value two. And likewise, I'm going to invoke Sledgehammer. And this should be looking very similar to the last line. Indeed, Sledgehammer has been able to find a proof and I can click it again and put it in the file and you can see it is identical. The only difference is it is now using assumptions one and three rather than assumptions one and two. And so with this, I've now been able to prove that the state of the acceptor is some value one and the state of the acceptor is some value two. Well, the only way how this can now be true is for value, and value one and value two to in fact be equal. So I should be able to show that value one equals value two. This ultimately here is uh, a nice way how I can pick up the results from the previous two lines. So you can see here at the bottom in the output that uh, the facts that I'm working with now at this stage are exactly the last two things that I've just proved. So let's try Sledgehammer again on this line. And Isabel has been able to find a very simple proof. In this case, it's using a different proof method. So previously it was using Metis. Now it is using Simp, which is just simplification of syntactic expressions. And that proves what we wanted. So I can write QED quod erat demonstrandum. And we have indeed proved this agreement theorem, of course, under the assumption of these two invariants. But this has still been very good progress because it means we have now shown that these two invariants are indeed sufficient in order to prove the agreement theorem. This is something that is not immediately obvious from just staring at the, at the invariants and thinking about it. So I already think that here Isabel has been a great help to us. It has helped us make sure that our reasoning is correct and it has helped us think about the problem that we're trying to solve um, by helping solve some of the individual steps of the proof for us. So even though we have to come up with the invariants ourselves, we were then able to check that those invariants were sufficient. So this now leaves us with the question of, well, are these invariants are actually true? So what we want to do in the rest of this proof is to actually demonstrate that those invariants also hold. So in order to prove these invariants, what I'm going to do is use a proof by induction. So you might have seen previously proof by induction in order to prove things about the natural numbers. So say you have some statement, um, some statement P, and you want to show that for all natural numbers, X, the statement P is true. So what you can do in order to prove by induction is to first show two other statements. So firstly, uh, prove that p of zero is true. So substitute the number zero in for x and show that the statement is true. And next, we're going to show that for any x, any natural number x, if we assume that p of x is true, we can show that p of x plus one is also true. And so if we have these two, that is actually enough to conclude that p of x holds for every x, every natural number x. Now this is very powerful because we've had to do only a finite amount of proof work here. So we had to, in order to prove this thing, we had to prove the first p of zero, which is known as the base case. 
and this property here, assuming p of x showed at p of x plus 1, which is known as the step case. So we have to prove these two things, but each of these is a finite amount of proof work, whereas this final result here now is making a statement p about the natural numbers, which is an infinite set. So we've made a proof about something infinite, but we only have to do a finite amount of work in order to do that proof. And that is the amazing thing about proof by induction, and we're going to use a very similar principle in order to actually prove the invariance. So what we have in our execution of the distributed algorithm is, well, the, the system as a whole goes through these steps one by one. And so in each execution step, remember what we said earlier, we call the step function once. So in each execution step, there's an event that occurs which triggers the step function, and that event causes one of the processes to perform one execution step. And the execution step has as input the old state and produces as output the new state for that particular process. And so the system as a whole goes through the sequence of execution steps. And what we should be able to show is, assuming that our invariants hold in the initial state, then we can make some number of execution steps and Let's say that the invariants hold in this state, A here. Let's say we can then prove that the invariants still hold in step B. So assume the invariant holds here, show that they still hold here. This now looks very much like a proof by induction, which should allow us to then prove that the invariant holds for every step along this execution, even though the execution might be arbitrarily long it might consist of an arbitrary number of steps. And so we can actually do this kind of proof in Isabel. What we do is induction on lists. So more specifically, we're doing induction on the list of events. And so our initial assumption, the base case of the induction, is that some statement P holds for the empty list. So the empty list means there are no events, that is, the the system is simply in the initial state. Nothing has happened. So we're going to prove that the invariants hold in the initial state. Secondly, we also need to prove that assuming some list of events, xs, that if we assume the property holds for xs, we can also show the property still holds for xs when we append a new element x to the end of the list. So this is like the x plus 1 in the induction on natural numbers. Here we're doing induction on lists where we're saying assume any arbitrary list xs and assume that the statement p holds for xs. Then we need to prove that if we append one more item to the end of the list xs, the statement p is still true. And so if p here is the invariant, then all of this gives us the thing want, that we want to show, which is namely that for all lists xs, the statement p of xs is true. And so this here is the real statement we want to prove. And like with proof on natural numbers, the cool thing with this proof here on lists is that it holds for lists that are arbitrarily long. So we don't need to assume any maximum length of lists. The lists can be as long as we want. They can be 100 million elements long or even longer, and it doesn't matter. And so like proof by induction on, uh, on the natural numbers, we've made a statement about an infinite set of lists. So this set of lists for which this statement is true, this set of lists is infinite because there's no limit on how, length the, how long each list in this set of lists is. And so this gives us the wonderful power of being able to prove, um, prove this statement for all possible states that a system, that a distributed system might get into. So I would like to show you exactly how, it is, how we do this proof by induction over the sequence of events, but I will show you a simpler example first, because doing this straight off the bat would be a little bit complicated. So I'm going to start with a simple and more contrived example first. So we're going to do a little example just on lists in Isabel. And once we have that, then we will return back to our consensus algorithm and do the proof 
over the sequence of events for the consensus algorithm. So the simple example that I'm going to use is a list consisting only repeated numbers of the number five. So we can have a list that is arbitrarily long, but we're going to constrain the list to consist only of fives. So it might be five, or it might be five, 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 or it might even be an empty list. And all of these are lists containing only the number five. And I can represent this kind of uh, list in Isabel like this. So I can use the inductive keyword to define an inductive, to make an inductive definition. And here I'm defining the, the predicate called only fives. And this predicate is defined as follows. So firstly, we have that only fives is true for the empty list. So we're saying the list containing no elements consists only of fives. Yes, that seems reasonable. Second part is we're going to assume for some list xs that this list xs consists only of fives. We're going to assume that, and if that is true, we will assert that we can append the number five to the list xs, and the resulting list still consists only of copies of the number five. So here we can think of this inductive definition here actually as a function definition, um, in which a function that takes any list and returns true if the list consists only of numbers five and returns false otherwise. But the way we have defined this uh, predicate, only fives, recursively means that it actually does this for arbitrarily long lists again. Now, what we want to prove about this only fives predicate is that we can take two lists consisting of fives and concatenate them and the result will still only consist of fives. Okay, so I said this was a slightly contrived example, but bear with me because we should do the proof for this theorem first and then we will come back. So I'm going to assume firstly that the list xs is a list consisting only of repeated copies of the number five. And also I'm going to assume that the list ys consists only of repeated copies of the number five. And under those two assumptions, I want to be able to concatenate xs and ys and the concatenation of those two lists should still consist only of repeated copies of the number five. Let's jump back to Isabel and see how we might prove this uh, fact here. So first of all, I've copied this definition, this inductive definition of only fives, uh, which is exactly as I showed just now. And now we're going to, we want to prove the theorem So I can give it any name, I can call it here only fives concat, for example. And what we want to do is assume that uh, xs consists only of fives. And we want to assume that ys consists only of fives. And under these assumptions, we want to show that we can concatenate xs and ys and the result still consists only of fives. So I now want to prove this by induction. So we can do induction over any variable that is a list. In particular, we could do induction either over xs or over ys. And so they actually both work. I'm now going to do the induction over ys because that more closely resembles what we're going to do later when we come to doing induction over the list of events in a distributed system. And so to do induction, I need to say we're using the assumptions and we're going to do a proof by induction. I need to say which variable we're doing induction over. So let's do induction over ys. And then I need to say which induction rule we're going to use. I'm going to do uh, induction over lists. And this particular rule here means that each step of the execution is going to be appending one item to the end of the list. So we could also do it the other way around. We could also have the inductive step being consing one element onto the front of the list. Um, but I'm just going to use this one now it, uh, because it better matches what we will do later. And so here, now that I've just written this one line saying that I want to do proof by induction, Isabel, you can see here at the bottom, is already given us all the necessary things. So it's already telling us what the base case and what the inductive step is. So the base case here you can see is where ys is the empty list, xs remains unchanged. So we're saying that ys, uh, that xs concatenated with the empty list consists only of fives. 
And then here, the second thing is the inductive step. So fortunately, here we have a little bit of code generation. So I'm just going to click that, fix the indentation. There we go. So Isabel has now generated two cases for us and has added sorry to each of them. And so this first one is the base case where we want to prove that um, we want to prove that this holds. So we want to prove that excess concatenated with the empty list uh, consists only of fives. Now this should be easy because we know that excess consists only of fives and appending the empty list doesn't change excess. So Sledgehammer should be able to find this proof easily. Okay, it's done. This time it's using the auto proof method. Nice. Okay, so that's the base case of the induction done. For the step case, I'm just going to rename the variables to be a bit more sensible. So here we have these, these are the facts that we get to work with. So here we have the inductive hypothesis that XS concat YS consists only of fives. And the result we want to prove is that XS, the result we want to prove is that XS YS and finally y concatenated to the end, all of that consists only of y's, uh, only of fives. <clears throat> so how are we going to do this? Well, first of all, you can see here this uh, inductive hypothesis has two assumptions on it. So assumption that xs consists only of fives, that's fine, we have that assumption here. Also that ys consists only of fives, so we have this uh, the assumption that ys concatenated with y consists only of five. So we should be able to just remove the last y and the result will still consist only of fives. So let's try that. So it should be true that ys consists only of fives. Yes, okay, and we were able to prove that. So now we have that, we should be able to use this to get the inductive hypothesis. So let's see, we have here that y xs concatenated with ys consists only of fives. And if I run Sledgehammer on that, right, Sledgehammer has been able to find that as well. And so here you can see we're using ih, ih here is the inductive hypothesis. And we're using premises, which is um, I think this assumption here. And from those things, we were able to prove that uh, XS and Ys consists only of fives. Okay, so now the goal we want to get to is that we can still append Y at the end and the results still consist only of fives. So, well, in order for that to be true, we need Y to equals five, don't you think? So I'm going to make sure that that is actually true, that Y really is equal to five. And that should be the case because if you remember, we had this assumption here um, and that can only be true if y equals five. So let's see, right, we have this one. So you see it's using different proof methods. This time it's using BLAST, which is another built-in proof algorithm. Here it was using SIMP, here it's using BLAST. It doesn't really matter for our purposes. All of these are perfectly valid proof methods. Now, what we have here now is we should be able to use these two facts that XS concatenated YS consists only of fives and that Y is five. We should be able to use those to prove the thing that we actually wanted to prove. So let's again invoke Sledgehammer. I found a proof. <clears throat> Just give it a moment. And this time we can use force. And this completes our proof of the theorem because we've now proved the inductive step and Isabel knows that we were doing induction here and therefore it's been able to prove this property here that XS concatenated with YS consists only of fives and it's been able to prove that for any lists XS and YS that consists only of fives. So, as I said, this is a somewhat contrived example, but you can see here how we were able to work our way bit by bit towards completing this step, this proof by induction and thus being able to prove this property. Now let's move back to our list of events. And so what we want to do is to do induction over this list of events. So in particular, we want to say 
are two invariants that we want to prove. We need to first of all prove that they hold in the initial state. And then as the inductive step, we're going to say, let's say states is the state that can be reached after any number of execution steps of our consensus algorithm. If we now append one more event to the end of this list of events, we get back a new state, states prime. And in this state, states prime, the invariant should still be true. So let's go down to our invariance lemma and we can actually start doing the proof by induction here. So I'm going to start off in a very similar way like we did before. Uh, and I'm going to do again proof by induction. I'm going to do proof the proof over the lists of events. So events is our induction variable. Now here I need to define two variables as arbitrary. And what this means is that these variables can change value at every step of the induction. So if I didn't specify this, that would mean that uh, messages and states remain constant for the entire induction, which is not the case because of course in each step messages can be sent and states might change. So we have to just specify this in order to say that, the, that these variables may change at each step of the induction. And then finally, like in the last proof, I'm going to do the induction rule, uh, which is rev induct on lists. Okay. And so like before, we have a base case and we have an inductive step and you can see them down here. Isabel can do the code generation as usual. So like before, we have the base case and the inductive step here. So in the base case, first of all, this should be easy to prove, right? So we should be able to prove that the two invariants hold given the initial state. And remember, our initial state is that all processes are in state none. And so here, I'm just going to say we want to prove this statement here. And I'm going to do sledgehammer. And sledgehammer is able to prove the base case automatically. Very nice. Okay, uh, right, so before we continue, I'm just going to do a little bit of notation changing here. So I'm going to uh, add primes to the variables, messages and states. Uh, the reason for that will become apparent later. But for now, this is just a straightforward renaming. So I'm not changing the meaning of what I've done. I'm just uh, adding these primes so that our notation becomes more consistent later on. Okay, so now, before jumping into the inductive step, I need to show you a little bit more background about this execution. So I told you earlier that this execute here was a little helper that I had defined in a variable in order to describe the execution of uh, an algorithm in a distributed system. And so now we can actually, uh, actually before I show you that, I will briefly show you a little bit more notation about Isabel. So again, in comparison to Python, what I'm going to use now is this, the states, our states is like a dictionary or a hash map essentially, where the keys are process IDs and the values are the local state of those, of that particular process. And so in Python, I would write an empty dictionary. In Isabel, I'm just going to use a an anonymous function for this. So you already saw this earlier. I can have the function lambda x dot none, which says that all of our processes are in the state none. So here the argument x is the process ID, but I'm just going to ignore the process ID and say that all processes are in state none. Now in Python, if I want to update the state or of a dictionary, I can use square brackets and then assign a new value in Isabel because we've defined our dictionary to be essentially a function, I can do a pointwise update of this function. And so I can write D and then parentheses, key is assigned to some new value. And what this means is this returns a new function that is the same as D, except when you pass key, the key into D, into this new function, then what you get back is some value. But for all other argument values, uh, the function is unchanged. And so this is just a way of essentially writing 
an update to a dictionary in Isabel. And now if I want to look up something in that dictionary, well, I just call it as a function as usual. So treat d as a function and pass key as the argument. Also a little bit of notation on sets. So you already saw that in Isabel, just the curly braces, empty curly braces, denotes the empty set. And if you want to add an element to a set, you can just use the standard mathematical union operator to union one set together with a new set containing a new item. In order to say that some item is a member of a set, you use the usual mathematical member operation, the little e, saying that item is an element of the set. And then finally, one little weird piece of notation, which is the backtick. So what this says here is that the uh, function lambda item dot two times item, that you're mapping this function over all elements of the set S. And so here we're saying the set S will contain some numbers, for example, and you're going to apply this function to each of those numbers in the set, returning twice that number. And the result of this is going to be the set in which you have applied this function to all of the items in the set. So it's like the map function, but map, the map function is over lists, whereas this backtick operator is a function over sets. Otherwise, it's very similar to the map operator. OK, so given that bit of notation, I can now show you how this execute function here is defined, or the predicate. And so this is an inductive definition that is quite similar to that only fives inductive definition that we saw earlier. It's a little bit more complicated, but in, in reality, it's not actually that hard. So let me explain bit by bit what is going on here. So the, we have the inductive definition of execute and the first three lines are just the type definition. So let's ignore those for now. So the first line here is what specifies the initial state. And say this says here, we have a ex valid execution of our algorithm. So our algorithm has a certain step function, a certain initial state, and a certain set of processes. And we have a valid execution of this algorithm if the list of events is the empty list, that is no events have occurred. The set of messages that have been sent is the empty set, that is no messages have been sent. And all of the processes are in the initial state. So this init is just the same as the initial state here. So this one line here describes the initial state of our distributed algorithm, saying that all of the processes are in the initial state, no messages have been sent, and no events have occurred. OK, so that's our starting point for a valid execution. In the second line here, we're going to say, assume that we have some valid execution with some step function, some initial state, and some set of processes. And Furthermore, assume that this is the list of events from that execution, messages is the set of messages that were sent, and states is the final states that we're in. And what we want to show is now that from this, uh, from this state here, we can get to a new state, which this new state here has the same step function, the same uh, initial state, and the same set of processes. So those three things remain constant, but we have a new list of events, events prime, we have a new set of messages, messages prime, and a new uh, map of states, states prime. And so now we need to describe how the old events without prime relate to the new events. Well, the way they relate is defined on this line here. So we're saying events prime equals the, just the list of events before with one more event added to the end. And what we're adding to the end here is actually a pair consisting of first the process that is executing that event and then the event that occurred. Okay, so this describes how events and events prime are related. Messages and messages prime are similarly related. So we're saying messages is the set of messages before, sent is the set of messages sent in this particular execution step. And so we're here we're using the backtick operator which I just explained with mapping over this list of events that were sent, mapping this function here over those events. And all this says is this is function that takes a message and returns a pair consisting of a process and a message. The proc is the process that's executing, i.e. this process is the sender of the messages. So all this is doing is tagging all of the messages that were sent with the sender of that message so that we know where the message came from. And so here we are uh, adding two messages prime 
we are adding the set of messages sent in this step annotated with the current process that sent them. And finally, states and states prime are related like this. They are, we say, the states, all of the states remain unchanged except for the state of state proc, which is now in some state new state. And so all of the other states remain unchanged, only the state of process proc now has a new state. So now where do the messages come from and where does this new state come from? Well, they come from this invocation of the step function. So here we're saying step, that is the step function that was provided here. We're executing the step function with three arguments. Firstly, we're passing in the current process that is executing. Secondly, we're passing in the current state of that process. And thirdly, we're passing in the event that occurred. This is exactly the form in which I defined the step function earlier on. And what we get back from the step function is this pair of two things, the new state of that particular process, which we then use down here, and the set of messages that are to be sent, which we use here. So this defines the step function. All that remains is to say that the process that is executing is one of the processes in the system. Okay, it's just any one of the processes executing. Um, and that the event is a valid event. So a valid event is just defined up here. It's a very simple function. And all this is saying is that a timeout event, that is always valid. So timeout event can always happen. A request event, a user request, that can also always happen. It's always valid. Now, a receive event, well, it only makes sense if we receive a message from the network if that message was indeed sent by somebody. And this is what is encoded in this uh, line here. So we're saying that a receive message, a receive event for a certain message by a certain sender is valid only if there exists this uh, pair here in the set of messages. So if the process sender did indeed send this particular, uh, this particular message to this particular process. So this is the recipient process here. Um, and if the sender did indeed send that particular message to that particular process, so if that is part of the set of messages, then it's valid to receive a message. So all this is saying is that a message can only be received if it was really sent. And this is a very reasonable thing to assume. So we are assuming here that the network does not just make up messages out of thin air. And we're assuming here that the uh, originator of a message cannot be spoofed. So we're assuming that here, if one process, uh, another process, one process cannot claim that a different process sent a message. So a process can only send messages under its own name. And so under this assumption, this now defines exactly how the old events and the new events prime relate to each other, how the old messages and the new messages prime relate to each other, how the old states and the new states prime relate to each other. And this is now exactly one step of the execution. So now we can actually use this in order to do the inductive step for our invariance. So remember we were here, we've done the base case of the proof that the invariants are true. That is, we have proved that the two invariants hold in the initial state in which all of the processes are in the state none. But so now we want to get to the inductive step. So let me just rename this to make it so that the variable names make a bit more sense. And there are a few things we first of all have to do in order to prepare things here. So really what I want to do is get these variables, messages, message prime, etc. So that we can see exactly what changed in this execution step. And in order to do that, I first need to unpack this. So here we have that events appended x is our list of events. But remember, x is actually a pair of a process ID and the actual event that occurred. So I'm going to first of all unpack that. So I'm going to say obtain proc and event where x is the pair of proc comma event. And I still have to prove that I can do this. So prove that I can deconstruct this pair x into two variables, proc and event, and fastforce can do that for us. Okay, so this obtain keyword here is a Isabel keyword that allows us to introduce new variables. And so I've just made up two new variables, proc and event, which satisfy this particular condition here. And I've proved that those variables do indeed exist. Okay, that's good. So now I should be able to 
say something like this, we have our execution step. And I'm going to say that I can append to the list of events. I can append this new pair of proc comma event that we just constructed. I can append this to the end and this should be valid. So that is we should, uh, here we go. So we should have uh, that this is a valid execution with this event appended with messages prime and states prime. So this is just clarifying exactly what we have. So now I want to get this relationship between messages and messages prime and uh, the states and states prime. So I'm going to use obtain again, and I want to obtain these new variables uh, in a way that shows exactly what this execution step was. And so for that, actually, I'm going to also obtain two more variables, which is the set of messages sent and the new state. And so if we now look back here in our definition of execute, we have exactly the relationship uh, between these various variables. So let me just take these and copy and paste them in here. And I'm just going to comment them out for now. So we want to obtain these variables where first of all, we have the consensus step up to that point. So actually that is, um, if you take that from here. So we have a valid execution of the algorithm with the step function consensus step where the initial state is none, where the set of processes is universal, messages uh, with events, now events without this one appended, and that means the corresponding set of messages is messages without the prime and states without the prime. Um, so we have that this is a valid execution. Moreover, we must have that we are executing the consensus step. And so we're executing consensus step where the process that is executing is proc, where the uh, existing state of that particular process is states proc, and where the event is event. And I can just copy that from here. So the event that occurred is the event, and what we get back from this uh, step function is the new state pair of the new state of the messages that were sent. So that corresponds to this part here of the inductive definition. Next, I need to relate uh, messages and messages prime, which we can just take from here. So we have that already. And finally, we need to relate states and states prime. So I think that, whoops, I think that all of these should be true. We have now introduced these new variables. So let's use sledgehammer to make sure that those variables really do exist. Okay, good, we have this. Uh, I'm just going to slightly change this to make the proof a little bit neater. And we can just use auto, very nice. I can delete these now. So now we've made some progress. So I now have these new variables, messages and states, and I have these other me variables, messages prime and states prime. So from our inductive hypothesis, we should know that the invariance one holds in the version of the variables without the prime. And then from that, we should be able to show, what we want to show really is that these um, two invariants hold afterwards. So, so our inductive hypothesis is that the invariants hold before the execution step. What we want to show is that they hold after the execution step. So in order to do this, I just need to give a few things names so I'm just going to call these here step rel one, two, three, four. 
the reason for that is that they say how the old and the new states relate to each other in one execution of the step. And so so now from the inductive hypothesis, we have exactly this property that we need here. So we have that the invariants hold before. What we want to show now is that the invariants hold after. So in order to show that the invariants hold after the step, we have to think about what is that step function actually doing. So our step function, if we go up here, well, first of all, it's doing different things depending on whether we are an acceptor or a proposer. So I guess we first of all need to differentiate on this condition here, like is the process zero, then we're going to go into the acceptor code. If the process is non-zero, then we're going to go into the proposer code. So we need to do a case split here. And I can specify the condition on which we're doing the case. And so in one case here, proc equals zero, that means we are in the acceptor. Otherwise, in the case where proc not equals to zero, that means we are in a proposer. And so we can handle these two cases separately. So again, I've generated the code. This is the case where this condition here is true. And this is the case in which that condition is false. So in other words, here we have the acceptor. And in this case, we have the proposer. And what we now want to show is that, okay, the invariants hold. Now this lemma here is getting quite long. So I'm going to start making a new one. This is just a bit like, you know, if you're writing in a programming language, once your functions get too long, you'll try to factor them out into smaller functions. So very similar principle happening here. And I'm going to start with a lemma for the proposer. And so this is going to say that we are the proposer uh, taking some step of execution. So we're calling the proposer step function with some existing state proc and some event. And what we're getting back is some new state and some, sen mess uh, some set of messages that were sent. And we have from before here the relationship between messages and message prime and states and states prime. So I'm just going to copy those. And then we have the fact that we have a valid execution, which we have from here. And um, finally, we have our assumption that the invariance holds in the state before. And under all of those, assumptions, we want to show that the invariants still hold afterwards. Okay, so I'm just going to sorry that for now. And let's jump down here and see if that lemma is actually sufficient in order to uh, prove the property that the invariants are satisfied for the proposer. Okay, that worked, that is nice. We can use this proof down here. Now it's a pretty long proof. I can shorten that a bit just by making an, an alias for this particular fact here. Let's call that uh, exec. Then I can replace this long string here. And uh, maybe this one here we can call invariance before. Then I can call this here. Okay, that's a bit nicer now if it's on one line at least. So here we have a proof that using the lemma here, we can preserve the invariance, invariance one and invariance two, uh, in one execution step of the proposer. Okay, so now this deals with the proposer. How do we break it down further? Well. In order to do that, let's have a quick look at 
the actual code of the proposer. And so if you remember what it looks like here, we're doing this pattern matching on the type of event. So first of all, we're doing one thing if the event is a user request, and we're doing another thing if the, if the event is a message received from the network. So I guess we need to handle the different types of events separately. And so we can do that again by using a case split. So we can do proof by cases on the event. And so Isabel, because it has a type system, it knows that an event can have exactly three possible constructors. There's a receive, a request, or a timeout. And so as before, we can generate some code for this automatically. And that will give us three cases that handle the three types of event that could happen. And I can give these some better names. So, so we see receive a certain message from a certain sender and the request has a value. Okay, that looks a bit better now. And now we can think about each of these cases independently. So first of all, in the case of a timeout, well, in a timeout, we're not handling the, that case explicitly. So a timeout will always go to this fall through step here. Um, the no op, the no op case in which the state doesn't change. And so, well, if the state doesn't change and the invariants hold in the state before, then obviously they must also hold in the state afterwards. Here, that means we have that um, we have that messages equals messages prime and states equals states prime because nothing is happening in this particular case. And so, right, we can prove that nothing has changed. And then because nothing has changed, that means this our thesis here must also be true. Good. So this way we've now proved that in the timeout case, our invariants are preserved. Let's move up to the user request case. So in the user request, well, the next thing we need to look at is how further is this broken down? So here we have the user request, but we also have this. So the, we're assuming that our local state is none. So if our local state was already decided some value, then we would not actually hit this particular case. We would hit the, the no op case. So in the case where the, uh, we can only make progress in the case where the local state is none. So we will have to do another case split depending on what the current local state is. So here, when we are proving our invariants, we're going to do cases depending on what the local state is. The state of process proc, because it's process proc that is executing here. As before, we get some code generation. So the, it might be that uh, our local state is none, in which case we will do something, or it might be that our local state is some v. So as I said, this again will be a case that is ignored, no op. So in this case, again, it should be simple to prove that the invariants are preserved because, well, nothing interesting is happening. And so again, we have a proof. And we can insert that proof into the file. And that completes this particular case. So now we're left here in this one where the local state is none and we have received a request from a user. So now in this case, what is happening? We can check our definition again and so in this case, our local state remains none, so our local state remains unchanged, but we are sending a message. So we're sending this propose message. Okay, so this is now interesting. We should now be able to figure out, uh, we should be able to determine here exactly what the relationship is between messages, messages prime and states, states prime. So we're saying, we said the state remains unchanged in this case. So we should be able to prove that states prime equals states. Moreover, for messages, 
Well, messages prime will be the same as messages, but with one more message is added. So we do a union here. And what we're sending is this propose message. We're sending it uh, with a sender. The sender is proc. That's who is sending the message. The recipient is zero. The so recipient is the uh, acceptor. And the message we're sending is propose val, where this value val is the value that was in the user request. So I think this should be true. And Isabel should be able to figure this out by looking at the definition of the step function. And so now, because we're exactly in that one case where we're handling a user request and our local state is none, well, Isabel can use this fact. So it uses the fact that we're handling a user request and the local state is none and the assumptions above to prove that this is indeed the relationship between states and states prime and the relationship between messages and messages prime. Okay, now let's work with that. Uh, again, this lemma is getting a bit big. So let's break this out into a different lemma again. So what we are dealing here is the moment at which a user makes a proposal. So a user requests a, um, a user requests that a certain value be decided. And what we know is that messages and messages prime are related in this way. And we know in that our two invariants hold. So invariant, so invariant two. And so under those assumptions, we want to show that the invariants still hold for messages prime. So remember states and states prime were the same. So I can just leave the same variable states here. And I'm going to put a sorry for here now and check if this invariant proposed lemma here is now sufficient to prove the case we were in here. So, so the thesis we are trying to prove is again our two invariants. And I'm going to use sledgehammer. And yes, so using this invariance proposed lemma that I just wrote a few lines above, we can now prove that the invariants do indeed hold in this case. Okay, good. So I'm going to Let's have a look at this invariance proposed lemma now, see if we can finish out the proof for this particular thing. So if you look at the two definitions of the invariance up here, we have that these, they depend on accept messages being in the set of messages. But here what we're doing is we're adding a propose message to the set of messages. And if you look carefully at the definition of the two invariants, neither invariant cares at all whether there's a propose message or not in the set of messages. So propose messages are simply irrelevant to the two invariants. And so here, well, this means now when we're proving this, it should be the case that a, um, that a message appears, sorry, that an accept message appears in messages prime exactly then if it also appears in messages because we're not changing the accept messages in any way. So for some sender, some recipient and some, some val. So this message should appear in the set of messages if and only if that's a two two sided arrow if this same message appears in set of messages without prime. And this should be true for all senders, for all processes and all values. Okay, so does this make sense? So I'm saying because we know that messages and messages prime the relationship between them is just that one proposed message was added. We do not change the accept messages in that set of messages in any way. And so that means if a certain 
message appears in one of those two sets, a certain accept message appears in one of those two sets, then that accept message must also necessarily appear in the other set. So let's see what Sledgehammer thinks of this. Great, that is true. And so now I think that should be actually sufficient to prove the two invariants because, well, what we've said is these invariants depend only on accept messages. And we've said that messages and messages prime are equivalent with respect to accept messages. And the states have not changed because states before and afterwards remain the same. And so now I think this should be enough that this should be enough to prove that the invariants hold. And indeed it is. So we have a proof for this particular case. So we have a proof finished that in the case where the proposer is proposing, so where the proposer is sending a proposed message, that particular event preserves the two invariants as well. This is really good progress. So if you look what we have here now, there's one, this one more sorry here in the case where a proposer is receiving a message and we still have one more sorry down here for the acceptor. Okay, so let's continue a little bit further with the proposer. And so the third type event for the proposer is that it received a message over the network. And that message that it received, well, again, there are two types of messages, aren't there? So let's say, we need to distinguish depending on the type of message because a message could be a proposed message or it could be an accept message. And so it could be a proposed message with some value V or an accept message with some value V. And well, here we are the proposer. So what does the proposer do in terms of receiving messages? Well, it only is interested in accept messages. So if a proposer receives a proposed message, it will just ignore that. Receiving a proposed message will again hit the catch-all case here at the bottom. So that means in this case here where a proposer receives a proposed message, well, nothing interesting happens. So again, Sledgehammer should just be able to find that this is a no-op. And here we have again a proof using the fact that we are receiving a proposed message. In this case, the invariants are preserved because nothing interesting happens. So the interesting case is this one here where we receive an accept message. So now receiving an accept message in a proposer looks like this. And notice that here again, we depend on the local state. So we are actually, we're going to perform this action here only if our local state is actually none. So we need to do another case split again, depending on the local state of the proposer at the time when it received this accept message. So local state is states proc. And again, we have two possibilities that the local state might be none, that's the interesting one, or some uh, existing decided value, in which case we will just ignore the uh, accept message. So in this case, again, it should be easy because we're just ignoring. Okay, good. So now we're down into this subtree here where we know our local state again, and we know that we're receiving an accept message. And so what happens here in the proposer when receiving an accept message is, okay, we update our local state to be some value and we do not send any more messages. And so in this, that means in this state here, we now know our relationship between messages and messages prime well, they must be the same because we are, not, no, we are not sending any messages. Furthermore, between states and states prime, well, they will not be the same 
because the local state of the state of the process proc is being updated to some v, where v is the value contained within the accept message. So let's see. This should be our relationship between our old and new states for this particular case. Good, and we have that as well. So now I'm going to factor this out again into another lemma because our lemma is getting quite long. So let's take that particular thing we have learned. I'm going to call this lemma the learning invariant because this is the moment where the uh, proposer learns the decided value. And so, okay, so we know that this is the relationship between old and new states. And we also know that this accept message was sent. So, because we know that this accept message was received, there must also be somebody who sent it. So this message must be in the set of messages that we have. So let's make that explicit as well. Let's call this val here. And again, like before, we know that our invariants hold before, except here we have messages and States prime. So our mess set of messages is unchanged, but our map of states is updated. So let's see if we assume this, is this invariant learn lemma enough to prove out this particular case? Let's try. And it looks like it is. So here we have, using this invariant learn lemma that I just wrote, we are now able to prove that the thesis here, this is just, I can copy and paste it again, just that the invariants hold afterwards. And we were able to prove that. And so this has actually now finished the proof for invariants proposer. So for this particular lemma, you can see, I think there are no sorries left here. And you can see that Isabel is checking. So that little orange pinkish background, it's Isabel checking the proof over and over again. And it seems like everything is fine. So yes, we haven't yet started on the acceptor, but we're almost done with the proposer because the only thing remaining in the proof of the proposer is now this invariant learn lemma. So let's work out this one here. So for this one, I'm going to prove the two invariants separately. And so I'm going to do some curly braces to enclose the proof for one invariant. And then I'm going to come back and do the proof for the second invariant as well. So for the first invariant, let's just check the definition of this again. So here, I'm going to copy the definition and put it in here because this will be useful. So we want to prove that this thing is true, right? For messages and for states prime. So here, what I can use is another bit of Isabel syntax. I'm going to fix some variables P and V. And so those are going to stand for proc and val. I'm giving them different names. Otherwise, these names are going to collide with the names proc and val up here. So here, fixing P and V says for arbitrary values of P and V, the following is true. And we're going to assume what is the left-hand side of uh, this implication here. So for this implication here, the left-hand side is that our process is zero and that we're doing this for states prime, the process, is, the value is some V. And we, what we want to prove then is the right-hand side of the implication. So the right-hand side is there exists some sender such that the message with recipient P 
the message accept v is in the set of messages. Now, okay, how do we prove this? Well, I think it will depend on p and proc. So let me just write this out. Let's see if p equals proc, in a case where p equals proc, in that case, well, in that case here, states prime is being updated. We know that here states prime for the particular value proc is some val. And so in this case here, where p equals proc, then that must mean that um, this assumption here will be satisfied with val equals v. And so then because we know by this assumption here that accept val, equal, uh, accept val appears in the set of messages, then accept v must appear in the set of messages if v equals val. And so I think this might be just about simple enough for Sledgehammer to do by itself. And it is indeed, good. I'm just going to give this a name to make the proof a little bit neater. There we go. And now finally, in the case where p not equals to proc, well, in that case, states and states prime are the same here. And so states prime for p will be the same as states, uh, states for p. And in that case, we have by invariant one, under the assumption of invariant one, we know that exactly this accept message must exist in the set of messages for that uh, matching that states. And so in this case, again, I think we're in a place where this is simple enough for Isabel to do by itself. This is great because these kinds of reasoning steps would be really quite fiddly to do by hand and to convince ourselves that they really are correct. But Isabel is all, Isabel's automation is able to do that very nicely. And so this is actually enough now to prove the invariant one. So we've done the invariant one here. For um, messages and states prime. Let's just check that. Good, yes, so invariant one is proved. Let's continue with invariant two. So invariant two, again, I'm going to go to the definition and copy and paste definition of the invariant. And as before, we're going to fix some variables. So here we have for all sender, all recipients and all values. So I'm going to call sender and recipient. Uh, I'm just going to call P1 and P2. It doesn't really matter. Value will be V again. And our assumption is going to be, again, the left-hand side of the implication. So here, except that we now have to replace our processes P1, P2, and V. And what we want to show is the right-hand side of the implication that state afterwards our process zero is some v. And I think this is actually enough for Sledgehammer just to do it directly. Simple enough. Good. Here we have it. So that is already the proof for invariant two. So from these two, I should be able to conclude that both invariant one and invariant two hold. Here we have it, very 
simple from just the definitions of the two invariants. And that is enough now to prove this invariant learn lemma. And this now means that we've now fully done the proof for the proposer. Wait, something is it's complaining about something here. What's the problem here? Ah, right, I need to say show here. There we go. Okay, we have completed the proof for the proposer. You see, it ended up being a bit long, but most of it was very mechanical. Most of it was just going through this big tree of case splits and splitting first on whether it was propose or acceptor, then splitting on the type of event, then potentially on the type of message in the case of receive, then splitting on whether the local state was already decided or not, and then finally and only two out of those many cases there was actually something interesting, and we proved that the invariants were satisfied in those two cases where a proposed message was sent and where the proposer learnt its decided value. So if you've made it to this point in the video and worked through all of the proof up to this point, well done, big effort already. So unfortunately we're not quite finished yet, but I'm going to leave it at that. What we would still need to do to really complete this proof is to go through the proof for the acceptor. And for the acceptor, all of the cases look pretty similar. So similarly, we would first need to case split depending on the type of event. In that case, if it's a timeout or it's a user request, we just ignore it. If it's a receive event, we would case split depending on whether it's a propose or an accept. Accept message would be ignored. For a propose message, we would case split depending on the local state, if the acceptor has already decided or not. And then we would have, in both cases, an, a message sent. In the case where it's undecided, we would also have a state update, so that in both cases, then we end up with the sent message being matching with the local state of the acceptor. And again, we could propose, we could prove that both of the invariants are then satisfied in, uh, after one execution of the acceptor step. So that's enough for the proof. The last thing I want to say about Isabel is that now we have got these function definitions and we have formally verified that these function, our step function that implements the code for the acceptor or for the proposer, we've formally verified those functions to be correct and for this algorithm to be correct. So these functions can now also be exported to your favorite functional programming language and thus they can actually then be incorporated into real programs as well. So this is a way how it is possible to put these formal, formally verified algorithms then into practice. We can not only prove them correct, but then actually use them for, the, for actual real execution. Thank you very much for watching. If you want to play around with the proof yourself, I've put the, uh, the full proof files online at this URL, so you can download it. You can download Isabel for free, it's open source, and have a play around with it and see what you think. So thank you again very much for watching and hope to see you another time.